Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Attorney Job Logger, Law for the Everyday Layman. Today we'll talk about part 3 of my series on the law of succession. Now if you've been enjoying my videos and you want to see more, please hit the subscribe button. Okay? Now before we proceed, I would just like to reiterate that this series of videos is merely educational or informative in purpose. Okay? And it's not meant to serve as a proper substitute for proper legal advice. Now, if you are planning the estate of your loved one or your own estate, or if you're settling the estate of a deceased loved one, please, I implore you, get expert or professional help. The principles I will be discussing today and in my previous videos are only general and brief in character. And uh, particularly on the law and succession, which is a four or five unit course, I certainly cannot cover all of the concepts in such course. Okay, so th these videos only have the goal of giving you a working knowledge or general idea on how the law on succession works. Now, with that, let's proceed. Okay, so what is this uh, law on legal or intestate succession? Okay, the law gives us four instances when this occurs, but for our purposes, let's just talk about the two more important ones. Legal or intestate succession takes place either when a decedent or a person who dies has died either without a will or he made a will but he did not dispose of his entire free portion totally, meaning he left some which he did not or was not able to distribute. Okay? Now, to fill in the gap, the law comes in and tells us to whom we can give the shares of the estate of the decedent and in what proportion. Okay? So now, how do we determine who inherits? Let's lay the foundation by giving a few definitions. First, we have the word degree. I'm sure you've heard first degree cousin, second degree cousin. A degree simply refers to each generation. So, in order to determine what degree your relative is uh, to, uh, in relation to you, you simply count one generation up until you reach the common ancestor, then go back down to that relative, okay? Now, we go to a line. What is a line? A line is a series of degrees. And we have the direct line, which can be either descending or ascending, okay? It's a series of degrees in the descending line for the children, grandchildren, or the ascending line for the parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. Okay? Now, we also have the collateral line, meaning the, the persons in this line all find their route to a common ancestor. So usually, the collateral line consists of brothers or sisters, whether of the full or half-blood. Okay? Now, let's move on to the more important principles in determining who inherits, okay? First, we have the principle of preference in lines, okay? Remember, a line can be either direct descending, direct ascending, or the collateral line, okay? It refers to a series of generations. Now, how do we determine who will inherit? We follow the principle of preference in lines, which states that the direct descending line excludes the direct ascending line. And the direct ascending line excludes the collateral line. Okay? So the direct descending line consists of the children, or if a child has died, then his own children, which are the grandchildren of the decedent. Okay? So now, in case all those children are surviving, then none of the ascendants and none of the collateral uh, relatives can inherit from the decedent or the person who died, okay? But if there are no children, no grandchildren, then it is the turn of the ascendants, parents, grandparents to inherit. And if there are surviving ascendants, parents, grandparents, they exclude the collateral line. Meaning the brothers and sisters cannot inherit if there are parents, Okay? Parents or grandparents. Now, if there are parents or grandparents, brothers or sisters cannot inherit. But if there are no more parents or grandparents, then that is the only time brothers and sisters can inherit. 
with either of uh, any of those lines, uh, descending, ascending, or collateral, the surviving spouse of the decedent can inherit with them. Okay? Okay. Let's go to the second principle. Okay? The second principle is known as the principle of proximity. Proximity, meaning the closest, no? So, those relatives who are nearest in degree, first degree, second degree, okay? In the same line, line of uh, descending, uh, direct descending, direct ascending, or collateral line, no? The relatives in the nearest degree in the same line exclude the more remote ones. Meaning, if there are relatives of uh, the first degree, then second degree should not inherit. And so on and so forth. Okay? Now, let's go on to the final principle which states that Relatives of the same degree will generally inherit in equal shares. Okay? Now, let's just say a decedent has four children, then these four children will inherit in equal shares. That is the general rule. Remember, this is the law on intestacy and there is no will. So the testator did not have any say in how much each child should receive. So the presumption of the law is they shall receive equal. That is the same if it is if there are no children and there are only descendants. All four descend I all four ascendants will receive equal shares. Okay? Now this rule that uh, relatives of the same degree inherit in equal shares has an exception. Okay? First exception, okay? What if the surviving uh, heirs of the decedent are paternal and maternal grandparents? And on the paternal side, both grandparents are alive. And on the maternal side, the maternal grandparent is only the male one. So, the paternal grandparents will get one half of the estate. And the maternal grandparent that is left gets the other whole of the one half. Okay? So, they are not equal in that sense. Next, if there are brothers and sisters of the full and the half blood, they are all on the same line, correct? But they are full and half blood. A brother or sister who is of the full blood gets double the share of a brother of si or sister who is half blood. Okay? Next, no? The right of representation. Okay? What is this right of representation? It's a fiction of law by virtue of which the children or uh, of an heir is entitled to inherit from the decedent. Okay? So now, let's say this is the decedent. And he has four children. Okay? This child has died before the... Uh, this child has died, no? After this uh, decedent has died. But this uh, child, in turn, has four children. The share that this childhood died, which is equal to the other children, will now be divided equally among the four. Because... The nature of their of these grandchildren's inheritance is called under the law per stirpes, not per capita. Per capita means per head, no? Uh, they will get a share equal to each head who has received. No, that's not the rule for the right of representation. In right of representation, those who inherit through another, okay, only receive his share which they divide among themselves equally. Okay, that's how the right of representation works. Now finally, let's go on to how the estate will actually be divided. I will just give a few examples because there are so many ways that the estate can actually be divided. Okay? Now let's say only one class alone survives. Let's say it's only the legitimate children or it's only the illegitimate children, only the legitimate ascendants or it's only the surviving spouse. Any class alone, all the brothers and sisters, any class alone will inherit the whole estate. No problem. No need to divide it because it's only them. No, the only, the only problem is just to divide it equally among everyone who is left behind. The problem happens when there is concurrence of different heirs. Okay, let's try first. A legitimate child survives with the surviving spouse. Okay, this estate, okay, will be divided in half. One half goes to the legitimate child, divided equally, and then the surviving spouse gets a share equal to one legitimate child. Okay? The rest will now be divided in proportion to the number of 
shares each one has received. Okay? Next, what is if there is a, that is, uh, the, the example I gave earlier is according to the theory of uh, concurrence, no? Next, uh, what if a legitimate child survives with a surviving spouse and other illegitimate children, no? Again, the whole of the estate, one half goes right away to the legitimate children. If there are, uh, let's say, four, then this one half will be divided into four pieces, okay? The surviving spouse gets a share equal to that of the surviving, uh, of the legitimate children. And finally, the illegitimate children get the share of one half of the share of each legitimate child. Okay? Just remember that principle. If you're wondering what the share of an illegitimate child is, it will depend if there is a legitimate child. If there is a legitimate child, the share of an illegitimate child will always be one half of what a legitimate child receives. Okay? Now, let's say uh, brothers and sisters are the surviving heirs together with the surviving spouse. Okay? The brothers and sisters, no matter how many they are, let's say they are 10, they get one half of the estate and the other half goes straight to the surviving spouse. Okay? So those are uh, common examples. Uh, and uh, what if, uh, let's pose the question, what if there are no heirs at all? This has happened, no? Uh, the decedent has no brothers, no children, no parents, did not marry. Let's say he's been living as a hermit, no? But he's very rich. To whom does his property go? The law says the, that, the, that the properties of the decedent will be escheated, okay? Or forfeited in favor of the state. In other words, it is the country through the government which will inherit the land of a person who has no heirs okay by default the state is your heir okay so i hope this has been educational for you and uh, this concludes my uh, series on uh, the law and succession if you found this uh, informative and you would like to see more again please hit the subscribe button thank you